Welcome everybody, it's Emmy season and what a great time to start the show, Carolyn Talks Television. I love television and I love sharing it with so many people because there's so much out there and we don't know what's happening and where it all is, but you'll be able to find it here at Carolyn Talks Television. I'd like to introduce today my first co-host and guest, Rachel Arnett, Hello. who's here visiting, is another television enthusiast, mm -hmm. as well as an expert on one of the shows we'll be talking about later today. I'd like to start, though, with a show that's been a breakout hit this year, This Is Us. <laughs> yes. The only show my mom talks about all the time. <laughs> it is so amazing that a network show for the first mm -hmm. time on a standard network has received 11 Emmy nominations. It's been years since that's happened. Mm -hmm. So let's talk a little bit about what do you think This Is Us has brought to the, the airs that we haven't seen in a while. Why has this network show mm -hmm. gotten so much attention? What do you think? It's just brought so much energy and I know that's kind of a weird word to use for a television show but they bring family drama but in a way that's really realistic it doesn't feel like a soap opera everything that's on it feels like it could happen and I think a lot of people connect to the stories of the individual people there's every you know everyone can connect to someone on that show and I think that's been a big thing absolutely absolutely you know what was interesting too I still remember seeing the very first episode and Spoiler alert, folks, there's a really major surprise ending at the end of the first episode, mm -hmm. and I may give it away because the whole show mm -hmm. takes place or appears to take place in the present. Mm -hmm. But the biggest clue at the end of the episode, and you have no idea yep. because it's so seamlessly edited, yep. that all of a sudden, you see someone smoking in a maternity ward. Yep. <laughs> Did you catch that? Yep. I remember watching that and saying, huh? Who edited yeah. this? What's going on? Yeah. I thought there was some kind of error. Yeah. yeah. And then all of a sudden you see him smoking, and then you see other strange things happening that you wouldn't see in a hospital, certainly in 2017, even and, post-2000. And are a little strange. Like hipster, I, I thought I was like, oh, okay, it's a hospital of hipsters. I get it. <laughs> I totally get it. They're like digging the 70s vibe. I totally see it. But then it was everyone. <laughs> but then everyone was digging yeah, the 70s was digging, vibe. Yeah, exactly. And suddenly you realize that you've been watching two generations yep. of a family. Mm -hmm. And you still don't even know by the end of the first episode yeah. just how extensive this family is and their connections. Yep. Now, it, it makes you want to watch more. It made me want to watch more immediately, that big twist. Absolutely, absolutely. Now, what did you think about the development of the children, mm -hmm. and I call them the children, yeah. but the adult children, yeah. on the show, and how they were brought uh, through their paces to show where mm -hmm. they ended up in their 30s? Mm -hmm. uh, it talks about triplets becoming 36, triplets yeah. who are sort of two triplets plus one. Yeah, yeah. And where they are in their lives, where they are in their positive way, and also what brought them to being some of their negative sides. What yeah. did you think about that? I think that the show did a really good job, um, and the writers did a phenomenal job, of making these characters fully human. And I think that they did a really good job of showing us you know, where they are now and what events transpired in their lives that kind of led them to those places. And I think it was all really realistically done, which was something that I loved about it. There was never something where I just kind of rolled my eyes and said, oh, okay. And it, you know, it, there were very subtle little things that happened, um, especially in the relationship for me between the brothers actually, yes. and kind of the tension that always existed between them and how they're just now at the present kind of sorting that out, I thought was really beautifully done. I, I agree, I yeah. agree. And I think that's why we see that one of the brothers, Sterling Brown, mm. who is, you know, 
an thing. incredible <laughs> yeah. actor yeah. in everything he's been in, yeah. has once again been nominated for an Emmy Award yeah. for his role. Um, he plays Randall yep. on the show. Who I think is my favorite. Oh, he is oh, your yeah. favorite? Oh, yeah. He, he, to me, just kind of really perfectly encapsulates the need for perfection and the, but the constant striving while putting on the face of everything's okay. And I thought that his portrayal of Randall as someone who's very capable but very anxious was so on point for a lot of what people experience. And the way that it kind of fell apart, the way you kind of have to fall apart to build back together. Absolutely. He's yeah. the type A guy yeah. who really doesn't want to be, I don't think. No. <laughs> I think he wants to have yeah. that warmth and that calmness, and yep. he just doesn't know how to go there. Because yeah. he's all about being type A yep. and impressing his dad, especially, yep. um, through his young life, impressing his dad, another Emmy-nominated um, Milo Ventimiglia, Mm -hmm. um, who is just amazing in his role and how he takes that character yeah. um, back and forth, but not completely into the present, which yeah. is another surprise we learn as the show progresses. Yep. We don't know this in the first episode. So once again, that, that development curve was really there for the yeah. writers. They knew where they were going, and according to cast, we are really going to see why we don't see Jack in the present. Yeah. What happened to him? And that's like the big mystery, really. It's it's almost like the first season of Desperate Housewives, where you're, the whole show is leading up to like why this happened. Yes, yes. Um, and I feel like that's the big piece. Everyone wants to know what happened to Jack. It's like who shot Jr. Who shot Jr. Right. <laughs> Everything. It, it's the 2016, it's the 17 version yeah. of who shot Jr. Exactly. Um, hopefully a little less tragically. Yes. But. We're not sure yet because yeah. it seems like a lot of lives were changed yeah. when Jack disappeared from the scene. Yep. Well, and it's interesting because he's built as, again, the duality of him as a father. He's, in many ways, a phenomenal father. You know, when the kids are all very young, you see him kind of struggling a lot less than Mandy Moore's character. But then you see that there's a lot going on under the surface for him. So. The and Mandy Moore, who plays mom. Yeah, who plays mom. And it's just really great, I think, to show that there's more to dads than just playing. And they really kind of explore what it means to be a dad then. And we can kind of look at it and say, well, is he like more of a dad now? Or is he more of like the 50s dad? Or it's right, like, right. you know, a pat on the head and go right for the whiskey. <laughs> you know? Yeah, really, really. Yeah. And we also see that we have actress, new actress, Chrissy Metz. Love her. Yep. And, you know, I know all of us have heard her story, but I'll just reiterate, she was down to her last mm -hmm. pennies, literally, ready to mm -hmm. leave acting. She was throwing in that towel, ready to go, went on this one last yeah. audition, and bang, gets this breakout role, and now she's an Emmy-nominated actress. Yep. Um, her role as... Kate, mm -hmm. the sister who seems to be almost the glue that keeps the family together. Yeah. She doesn't want to see her brothers uh, angry at each other, separating from each other. Mm -hmm. She wants to be the one who takes care and makes sure that yep. they stay together. Um, she seems to take a lot after Jack. And I think you know her relationship with him was very special based on what they sh you know what they show she had some issues with her mom but she really connected a lot with Jack and I think we don't you know like you said we don't know exactly what happened with Jack but she was very affected by it and she seems to have kind of taken over that role a lot I um, think even so. with um what's the other brother Kevin Kevin yeah with Kevin when he's having career issues and freakouts like that's the first call Always, and she almost takes over parenting for both, really, because right. they Kevin, are struggling. Kevin, played by yeah. Justin Hartley, formerly of Soap oh, Opera World, yeah, Young, the, Young and the Restless, yeah, um, has really developed uh, his primetime persona yeah. in Kevin and has made his sister, Kate, mm -hmm. really the surrogate mom. We don't see yeah. Mandy Moore in the mom role. No, not in really. Their, 
in the present mm -hmm. as much as we did when they're younger. And I wonder how much they're going to develop the Kate mom competition and we show, see it more yeah. the second season. I'd and, like to and, see that. And why that separation has occurred. Was it ha did it have something to do with the way Jack passed or just the fact that she's now remarried to Jack's best friend? There's, there's a lot of meat to kind of feast on there, there from a there writing is, perspective. I, I can't wait to see. I can't wait to see yeah. it either because I also see Kate's uh, envy of yeah. her mother. Mm -hmm. um, the mom is this gorgeous, successful singing person, mm -hmm. or at least in Kate's eyes she yeah, is. Yeah, absolutely. And now, supposedly, we're going to get to see Kate sing this yes. season. Which she did um, when it was at the retirement home. It was the very the end, yes, oh, yes. So she finally started fulfilling her own dreams rather yep. than fulfilling the dreams of her brothers and yep. holding everybody's hands and walking them to their dreams. Yep. It seems like we're going to see a little more of Kate taking care of Kate. Yeah, which, I, again, I think is so authentic. We can all think of that person in our lives. Yeah. I'm sorry, maybe it's us. <laughs> you know? Could be, could be. Um, especially when you become a mom, or in her case, like a surrogate mom role, you do start to put aside. And it's not always a bad thing. But then, you know, one day you, you wake up and you go, wait a second, I used to love karaoke. I used to love knitting. I used to love running. When's the last time I did that? Absolutely. So hopefully we will see This Is Us recognized for several Emmys because yeah. I personally think they deserve them and have loved that show. It's very rare you're engaged in a show from episode one and sustain the engagement. Yeah. And I think This Is Us was able to do that. Yeah. Um, if, if not build interest. Yeah. The last show for me was Parenthood, which is the same team really behind it. Parenthood I came into late and um, from episode one, I think I watched the entire series up until the last season and then watched the last season as it was going. It will Another always... Move. Yeah, very uh, moving, very yep. moving. And now I'd like to change a little bit to a yep. different Emmy recognized show. Yes. Totally different network. Yes. The National Geographic Network started a new project this year called the Genius Series. Mm -hmm. The Genius Series is meant to highlight historical geniuses in limited series runs. And their first genius, I think wisely selected <laughs> because of uh, being so well known, was Einstein. Yep. And now I'll share with you that Rachel works in a program called Mad Science yes. in the state of Connecticut where she goes around. Yep, and in Massachusetts sometimes. And in Massachusetts. Yep. And, well, tell them a little bit. What do you do for Mad Science? Yeah. Um, so Mad Science is a national organization, and then it's got um, branches, and we do everything from summer camps to birthday parties. Um, and so some of the ones I've done, we've done a rocket program. I did a workshop in Avon about worms, and so I got to bring worms and talk about worms and get the kids to actually touch worms and take it home. I, um, I'm not going to ask you do. to do that, please. No, okay. no, it's okay. Yeah. But it, it's just, <laughs> there's, you know, I come from an English background. So a lot of people are like, you, mad science. But it's, you know, there's something fascinating about the way the world works. And science is a great way to go about exploring that. And so you're, ch you're sharing this mostly with young people. Oh, yeah. This is a young yep. people's program to get them engaged in the sciences. Exactly. And to know that it's more than just lab reports. Okay. And, like that. and to be honest, full disclosure, I have a definite connection with Einstein myself yep. as one of the co-stars of Einstein is my brother-in-law, Richard Topol, who played Fritz Haber, mm -hmm. one of Einstein's later in life closest friends. Um, but going back, Einstein was nominated, although it's a limited run series, yeah. for 10 Emmys. Huge. And it takes the show... Uh, basically started, uh, the first uh, show episode is even directed by Ron Howard, mm -hmm. um, so well known. Yeah, exactly. Um, and takes the show from Einstein's early years mm -hmm. through his life and right up to the very end, right yep. up to the end. Yep. Um, it's a 10 episode mm -hmm. series. Um, and what they did was they start near the end, mm -hmm. or near the end of his time in Europe, and then we start heading backwards in time. Yep. The first half of the series, in fact, is not played by Emmy-nominated Jeffrey Rush, who's, who is the nominee for mm -hmm. the role of Einstein. We go back and we have young Einstein. And, the, 
and, and he is pl- Johnny Flynn, uh, who who I discovered through a Netflix series. Um, that is, um, it's got, it has two different names. Um, we'll call it Lovesick is the second name. Okay. And it's just really funny, witty British comedy that when you when you hear you know the topic of it, you're the, the reaction tends to go, ah, but it was a great show. So well, somehow Ron that. Howard recognized yeah. him as someone who could have the reach to play a young oh, yeah. Einstein. Absolutely. And truly, the first half of the series, it's this young man who is showing the beginning of the brilliance of Einstein mm-hmm. and how he breaks into his career. And also the man behind it, which I think is what drew a lot of people in and made it more of an, a show as opposed to just a documentary. Absolutely, you know? absolutely. Yeah. Um, and they do clarify that they do take, I don't want to say they take liberties, but this no. is an interpretation of history. Yeah. Um, the people who are filming it, the people who are acting it, were not there. Yep. And they are giving you what they consider as close to what they would interpret yep. as the historical way it probably happened. Yeah. Um, first of all, I'd like you to share a little bit about how you thought Einstein's um, breakthrough thoughts were displayed were displayed. I thought it was really interesting actually because they used a lot of different mediums but I loved that you know he would be standing outside and I think having a conversation with Marie um, who was one of his first loves that they displayed in the show and then all of a sudden you would see this writing appear in the sky in front of him or you'd see it zoom in on a star really far away and it was very animated while he's still standing there. It was almost like they put like a flat mesh screen in front of him with all of this stuff. And I thought it was fascinating because it sounds a lot like how people who are math geniuses describe the way calculations happen for them, that they can really see it all in front of them, these 10-page equations just kind of right in front of them. It seemed like they were trying to give us a window into Einstein's thoughts, his, his... actual processes of Which how were, he would just synthesize this information and mm-hmm. where it came from and also what may have been those tipping points mm-hmm. those moments said, of discovery yep oh my gosh the, the oh my gosh moments yep yeah uh, i think they did a brilliant job showcasing like like the revelations that he would have and did you think cuz i know they focused a great deal also on the drama of his life mm-hmm. and Einstein had much more dramatic life than yeah. I certainly personally was aware of before <laughs> I watched the series. Mm-hmm. Um, he was lived a very dramatic life, yeah. starting with his very first romance, but then moving into um, the woman he would ultimately have as his first wife. Yep. Um, and how brilliant she was. Yes. But the role he delegated her to yeah. at that point. And I, and I, um, with Maleva, I think they did a really good job of kind of contrasting that with Pierre and Marie Curie as well. So with Einstein and Maleva, they showed that he, di- he didn't use her. That's not the right term, but they kind of worked together and then eventually, you know, his star shone brighter and he became, you know, he was very focused on his work and she kind of fell into the background and they show her almost as a tragic figure in that sense, I think. Um, But then they contrasted that with the Curies and how he insisted that when he got a Nobel Prize that she got them as well. And I thought they did a really interesting job of kind of, I think, raising questions that they didn't answer. Which, you know, which one was better? um, What, you know, where did ethics and how do relationships get involved when you're working together and you love each other? I just thought they did I mean, a really good job. I mean, clearly Einstein, in, in this interpretation of his life, yeah. let us know that he verbally gave his wife credit for yes. her participation. In, but not on the paper. But never on paper. Yep. We do not see a uh, Maleva marriage on paper at all. Yep. Through his, and that's history. Yeah. Um, and then we see him moving towards the realizations mm-hmm. of development of his achievements yep. through the role of then Jeffrey Rush, Emmy-nominated Jeffrey yep. Rush, um, brilliant actor. 
brilliant actor. In everything. <laughs> in, in everything he does, yeah. exactly. He could be on screen for five seconds and win an award. Absolutely, <laughs> you know, just, absolutely. Um, or at least be nominated yeah, for exactly. it if he doesn't That's win true. it. Right. That's true. Um, how did you think he reflected the character of Einstein balancing his um, achievements, mm -hmm. um, going for his achievements, yeah. and then also the realizations dramatically of what was happening in his beloved Europe? Yeah. I think one of the reasons why I like the series, like I said you know, a little earlier, was that they focused on the man and the math and the science. And I think that when you do that, you get the opportunity to kind of explore what, you know, with development, there are also things, you know, when we focus just on the developments, you kind of a lot of times don't see the context of what's happening. And I think that they did a really good job of showing how torn he was, that, you know, he wanted to make these advancements, specifically the Nobel Prize. That was like his, his carrot that he was going after forever. And then he got it. But amongst all of that, his world was falling apart. Absolutely, and and I think um, I think Jeffrey Rush sort of sort of showed us how Einstein matured, mm -hmm. but never really got to that place where he was uh, a lovable old codger. No. That's for sure. No. Yeah. Um, and also, one thing to note is the development of the makeup, which is also nominated in this show. Yeah. Oh. They think they did such a good job. I think for me, they were like little Easter eggs where, you know, one episode, Johnny Flynn was wearing the mustache and the next episode, you'll see him with the pipe or the hat. And there are all these iconic images from the And the, the hair photos. beginning to even yeah. spread and start to <laughs> exactly. gray. Absolutely. Yep. The, the delicate touches. And I think that I would hope that if for no other yeah. reason than just we saw growth just in... Yeah physical maturity that we see the makeup people get yeah, that award because I do believe that's so well deserved and helped move the story along. Now just to touch upon a little something else now, mm -hmm. moving on from Einstein, I want to do a little switch and sticking with prime time today for our first episode um, of, of Carolyn Talks Television. I want to go with a show that's going to have a huge return. And it's, <laughs> I'm oh, so excited. Well, that's I'm good. I'm so excited. <laughs> no, you should be excited. I'm excited too. We now know, without a doubt, it's not a rumor. It's, it's, it's on. It's not a tweeted reunion it's, picture. It's not a tweeted <laughs> reunion picture that Will and Grace is coming back. Yes. Um, it's going back home to NBC mm -hmm. this year, and it is going to come back, I believe, in the present day. So we're going to see where Will <sighs> and Grace yep. and Karen and Jack are now. And, you know, that story was left in some fun spots. I know you were enthusiastic about the show, yes. and back when it was on, it was a bit groundbreaking. It was revolutionary. You know, uh, yeah. very few LGBT people were able to see themselves reflected mm -hmm. on screen at all, let alone on network television. Mm -hmm. But now, since, since Will and Grace, mm -hmm. there's been quite an arc yes. of programming, which I'll go into a little bit more on a later episode, but just to touch on a little bit, since then we've seen the development on a show called Brothers and Sisters, many of you may be familiar mm -hmm. with, that uh, featured a very loving relationship between Kevin and Scotty. Mm -hmm. um, we saw shows also on the network, Glee, mm -hmm. which had a teen to adult relationship grow in yep. characters Kurt and Blaine. Yep. And we also had um, Brittany and, oh gosh, yeah, the, there was the, there was a female yeah, couple there was as a female well. Couple on the Absolutely, show as well. you're yep. right, you're right. Um, and then if we move on to some of the other networks, we have currently the Fosters, yeah. where the youngest Great, child, yeah. even at 13, was realizing he was gay, and it was his learning to accept himself. Yep. In a home where that was not an issue because the moms were lesbians, yep. are lesbians. Yep. So it wasn't an issue, but yet he still had to accept himself yep. before then becoming a fully well-developed teen. Yep. And the Real O'Neills, which was just canceled and broke my heart. Oh. But Real O'Neills was a great example as well. Absolutely, absolutely. And then we move on to the premium channels. Mm -hmm. um, for example, the HBOs and the Showtimes. 
And we see shows like Queer as Folk, mm -hmm. that was certainly groundbreaking and oh, had absolutely. very fully developed LGBT community. Yep. Um, it was a British import. It was, yes. Yep. Yes, British import. But the U.S. changed it. Yes, tremendously. And the U.S. changed it for U.S. audiences, and mm -hmm. U.S. audiences want romance. Yes. And that was the biggest difference from yeah. that show. And I will go into more of that, like I yeah. said, on a later episode. <laughs> we'll talk about that. And we'll also talk about British imports, because we have so many wonderful oh. British imports. Um, and then we also have Shameless, mm -hmm. mm. which had a recent relationship between Ian and Mickey, and then moving on to other relationships yep. as well. But now going back, Will and Grace. Yes. Let's not lose track of that. I know. Will and Grace. So where do we think we can go now? Because Will and Grace mm -hmm. opened the door. Yeah. These other shows we just mentioned clearly not only stepped through the threshold, but just took hold, grabbed it, and ran with it. Yeah. I, I'm excited because I think when we look back, Will and Grace, like you said, started, but there were never really fully realized relationships outside of their friendships. Um, particularly for Jack and Will. And I think there's so much to build on. And I think, you know, they were groundbreaking in a lot of ways, but there's so much more they can do. They, there's mm -hmm. kind yes. of an intersectionality that, that, that was missing a little bit. Um, it was um, very, very much their experience. And I think knowing how groundbreaking they were in, in that way, they can be groundbreaking in a hundred more ways. I mean, one of the things we saw was, of course, Grace had romances mm -hmm. yep. through the series. While we knew of romances that Will and Jack had, they never really truly played out on screen for mm -hmm. us. Yep. Um, you know, they didn't deny them, mm -hmm. but in the same respect, and there, were a few hints there was not there. A, yeah. a true recognition. In fact, the relationship Jack had that was the most defined yeah was his relationship with his best bud, Karen, yeah. as opposed to the, being the a relationship. right? best character on the whole show, oh, Megan Mullally. Megan Mullally, right. You could have uh, the Megan Mullally show and I would watch have it. them, and she could just sit there sometimes and, and read a phone book, I'm and hoping we'd be happy. Her hu I'm hoping her husband, Nick Offerman, makes cameos on Will and Grace the way she used to make cameos on Parks and Rec. That would be fun. That would be fun. Yeah. So we will have much more on all of this. And thank you so much for joining me on the first episode of Carolyn Talks Television. And thank you, Rachel, Absolutely. for being my first co-host. <laughs> and you. hopefully you'll be back again with me at some point soon. Yeah. Thank you for joining me. And I hope you look me up on all avenues of social media. You'll be able to see where the addresses are at the bottom of the screen. And I'll see you online or back on show next time. Bye-bye.